Yeah? So, I mean, the three is still uh, false, at least in, in, this, uh, in this form of the statement, but at least you can integrate the algebra morphisms. I should, should say, of course, here we, in finite dimension, plays no role. We can just play or, uh, talk about the algebra morphisms. But in the infinite dimension setting, what you would like to integrate is locally, uh, the algebra morphism is locally convex in the algebras. So saying that the morphism here should be continuous, of course, right? And the continuity you get for free on the finite dimension. Okay. And let me explain to you what this regularity condition is. Uh, we are not going to prove that under the regularity assumption, uh, then this uh, statement of need 2 is, uh, is true, because that would uh, need some heavy machinery. And basically, our interest why we want this regularity condition is to construct something called the Hebrew exponential length. So that was also already mentioned today. And uh, you may, when you know finite dimension D theory, you might have wondered why didn't you already define the Hebrew exponential length. And the reason for this is because classically, if you want to define this exponential, you do this as uh, uh, a method which depends on solutions of ordinary differential equations. And a priori on these infinite dimensional space fields, we can we could have problems with the ordinary differential equations we wish to solve, right? So that, that was the whole point of this part in the appendix where we saw there are ordinary, there are spaces and ordinary differential equations which uh, seem very benign on first look, but uh, we have uh, once one tries to solve them, uh, it's impossible. Okay, so let me first. Okay, we found example of non-regular group because it was a problem that all non-examples of the groups were regular. Yes, and we have a problem. Okay, we cannot talk about this now. So there's uh, so unfortunately you don't know what regularity is, but let me uh, so let me show you one more thing. Before I explain to you what regularity is, bear with me for a moment. There is some property which is called regularity. And there's the so called Milner conjectures. And we model on uh, Mac A. Space is regular. This is the linear conjecture. The non examples about which I was talking are all constructed on incomplete spaces. So, this Mackey completeness is we saw this in one of the very first lectures. Uh, we can repeat it later on. It basically means uh, that if you have a uh, if you have a smooth path, as you see from let's say. Uh, some integral AB. So for every smooth part of AB is valid in the locally complex space, there exists a weak integral. Uh, so, right, so this was this was supposed to be the weak integral. Whenever we have a smooth curve into the uh, into our locally complex space, whenever the weak uh, so make a completeness we frame we cheated a little bit, so there is also a sequence uh, definition of what it means to make a complete using make a Cauchy sequences. However, uh, we said a space is make a complete if all of these integrals here exist. Right? And um, so it turns out if the Lie group is regular, we will we will see this as a, as a small uh, theorem. If the Lie group is regular, then its model space is automatically make a complete. Turns out if uh, you, uh, you can give examples of Lie groups modeled on non mechanical complete spaces where this regularity condition fails. Okay, let me just give you the regular condition because it's getting annoying to talk about the uh, uh, So this is three, three, one definition of regularity. And uh, unfortunately, regular is one of these words which is defined at least 20 times uh, in mathematics with, uh, in all different fields where stuff is regular, and you always mean something different. Unfortunately, it is the term uh, John Milner chose, actually, okay, person John Milner, so it is going back to work by Mori. Milner then uh, basically codified it in its uh, form. 
the setting is important. We have a new group G, which is associated with algebra LG. Um, we say it's semi regular. If for all smooth curves theta, so we have a smooth curve from the unit interval with values in frame, with values in the Z algebra. Yeah, so we take a smooth curve with values in the Z algebra. We can understand this smooth curve. So since this is a locally convex space, this is also a locally convex space that will be relevant in a moment. Um, so we have the smooth curve and uh, the initial value problem following the times. So we ask, we are searching for a curve gamma. We want the derivative of this curve gamma to satisfy the following. So we want the gamma um, multiplied theta to be the derivative of this. Now, what, what is the meaning of this? This is actually, if you know matrix Z groups, this notation is very akin to what you see by other matrix Z. What is the, I have said to the, what this lower point is. This is C lambda gamma of T um, applied to E. So we are using the derivative of the left shift at the point where we are to shift uh, the uh, tangent information at the identity to the right point. So, and then we want this thing at zero to start at the identity element of G. Uh, so we are searching for curves starting at the identity element. Can you see this on the back? Okay, good. Um, so we want to, uh, if this, uh, if the interval problem uh, has a, uh, this solution is necessarily unique. It has one as a unique solution, and we call this solution capital F of theta. And this is a curve from zero one going into the new G. Right. So this is not just a notation. Because people like to think of this as an evolution equation, so this is the capital F all, which maps a smooth mapping uh, from the unit interval with values in the Lie algebra to a smooth curve with values in the Lie. Then we call it semi regular. Now you ask, okay, if this is semi regular, what's, what's regular then? Uh, we actually want that this, these initial value problems, I mean, here, semi-regularity asks, can you solve these differential equations uniquely? Regularity is the stronger condition that you want the solution of your initial value problem to depend smoothly on the initial data. So since the only initial data we fed it, which we can vary very smoothly, this is, we are asking if we are changing these, uh, this curve eta here in the space of smooth functions from zero one to the Lie algebra is the operator uh, is the solution operator which maps an eta to f all of eta. Is this a smooth mapping? Actually, uh, okay, let's, let me put it like this. Then we have the regularity. So basically, we call it regular if this initial value problem depends smoothly on the initial data. And this is what you really, really would love, and what you know from uh, ODE theory in finite dimensions or in non Barnard spaces. If you have an ODE, this is an ODE, it's not a PE or something more fancy. Okay, so it's an ordinary differential equation. And on one hand, if we have non Barnard spaces, since that's no ODE solution theory, it's even unclear what the meaning uh, or uh, what is the meaning of this. Do we get any kind of solutions? So we have seen linear differential equations beyond Barnard spaces, which uh, uh, do not admit a solution or admit infinitely many solutions. Okay, so we have this, and we say uh, G is regular. 
gives it in the sense of Milner. If uh, the map, this is the small type of map, uh, in the C infinity functions with values in the D algebra to the D group G, which does the following takes an eta, sends it to the capital effort of eta, and evaluates the square root time one. Right? So if this uh, map is smooth, this is smooth dependence on initial values. You might wonder now we have the capital effort and we have the small effort. Uh, so actually, this is just a side remark, we will not use this. But what you can prove is this small map, this map small apple is smooth if and only if the following map is smooth. Which looks a bit, I mean, on one hand, one has to understand what is the manifold structure of this. Mm -hmm. We'll actually construct this in the next chapter. But uh, once one has this, looks a bit strange from the uh, from the function space perspective. I mean, obviously, if the capital apple is smooth, the small apple is smooth because we just evaluate in one point, right? And point evaluations. We have seen several times that point evaluations should be, uh, should be uh, smooth. So the small apple is just a capital apple composed with a Point one, uh, with the time one evaluation. Right? So this is smooth, like this. The converse is uh, tricky. Let's put it like this. And since we don't need it, we are never really talking about the smoothness of the capital element. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, that the proof that this is equivalent is due to Helge Wegner. Uh, so, uh, uh, so there's this Wegner uh, whose name appeared several times already. He has been working a lot with this regular information. Okay. The point is, um, so Milner's conjecture is that as soon as our model space is sufficiently complete, namely Mechagoni, which is super, um, which is a very, very weak completeness condition. So every other, basically every other of the same completeness condition, like uh, complete, sequentially complete, meaning that all Cauchy sequences converge in your locally convex spaces, well, all of these imply Mechagoni completeness. And uh, now comes what Irina has been say, uh, said. So, uh, Milner's conjecture from 83 or 84, I'm not entirely sure, uh, says that there is no infinite dimension even model on a same space um, where this completeness fails. And so far, all the Lee groups we have found, uh, I mean, all the people, so you find this in basically every book on, on the infinite dimension Lee theory. For every single one of them, there is um, there is a proof which establishes regularity. So we haven't found a single non-regular group model on a metric of deep space so far. All of the counterexamples work on non-metric complete spaces. And if you look at the counterexamples of the counterexamples of regularity, they are basically geared towards showing that stuff goes wrong if you don't have metric complete. They are really, in a certain sense, artificial. So it's not like it's not like they come up very naturally or something. So they've been built to be counterexample. We see this in construction. Um, however, there is unfortunately so this is still a conjecture. We don't have a general proof that this is true. I mean, uh, what would be very nice? You give me just an infinite dimension B group, and I have a theorem A, which says if this thing belongs to I don't know some some class of uh, of things. Then I know automatically that it's regular. We don't know that. Though in the in recent years there has been there has been some progress on uh, problems like this. So there has been work by uh, Maximilian Hanusch, uh, now in Paderborn in Germany, who uh, was able to uh, prove some automatic uh, regularity results in of the following kind. So he was actually able to show for a e group model on fresh air spaces. If you have a semi-regular Lie group model on a fresh space, then it's automatically regular. 
this, this is quite interesting because a lot of the actual examples of infinite dimensional groups are modeled on fresh ace basis. And this uh, makes life a lot easier because checking that this mapping will be really smooth is often a very tedious thing to do, right? Uh, because you have uh, then you again with the function space and it's on the wrong side because. I mean, uh, we have the exponential law only if the function space is in the target, which it is not. It's in the it's in the domain, right? And often this is a problem. Okay. Anyway, so this is regularity, and so far all the groups we know are regular. And depending on who you ask, and also depending on which year it is, people believe that this regularity conjecture of Milner is true, or uh, they have the hunch that it might not be true, but nobody has so far come up with a good idea of a counterexample, and, as, and we don't have any idea of a meter theorem establishing this, because all of the arguments are really tailored towards a specific situation of the Lie group at hand. So it's, uh, I mean, for the geomorphism groups, we know that they are regular, for example. And so this is one of the most, I mean, this is one of the earliest examples. But um, yes, so. So, so this is Milner's regularity conjecture, and. Uh, so I should say, uh, I mentioned this name Omori already, and this uh, notion of regularity is built on an earlier version. So uh, Omori, as in his work on Hebrews, was from the early 80s, there's a, uh, there's a property called mu regularity, which is stronger than Milner's notion of regularity. And John Milner was, uh, to my knowledge, the first one who one and weakened this notion of regularity by by Omori, and then proved that a lot of the least theoretic stuff which, uh, which you expect from finite elements, for example, like the proof that this uh, can be transported to regular G groups. So actually, this regularity condition so that you can solve these differential equations, this is essential to drive advanced tools in the dimensional theory. This is also always the reason. If you are reading one of my papers where I construct some sort of infinite dimensional group, and it's usually like, okay, we construct this infinite dimension equal, find out it's equal. Afterwards, we compute what is the Li algebra because we want to know what the bracket is. Once we are done with that, we prove that uh, the Li group is regular because we really want regularity. And uh, yeah, so uh, this is always sort of build a new Li group, identify Li algebra, prove regularity. So uh, unfortunately, there's no one there. So there's always something to do. Okay, right. So let me. Um, speak well a little bit more on uh, the regularity here. So on one hand, um, so this evolution here has a counterpart. We can actually go back. Um, well, with capital M, he has a counterpart, which is a so-called logarithmic derivative. Um, so if you have a smooth curve C from some interval A B. Values in G, uh, uh, we define the left derivative of delta L of C. This is then a curve from A B with values in the B algebra. And it just sends a t to uh, t lambda c t inverse of the derivative of this one. Right? So you're just taking the root, you add the tangent space over c of t, and then you're shifting this back using left multiplication into the tangent space at the end, which is the Lie algebra. Right? So this is a left logarithmic derivative, and uh, the role of this guy is if I compose this with the capital level of an eta, I get the eta. So what this shows is if I restrict here the capital E to all the smooth mappings 
which in zero have the uh, start of the identity or the smooth path starting at the identity, I see that the apple is a diffeomorphism onto the subspace, actually. No, we don't know what the what the smooth structure of this guy here on the right hand side is, but in a way this evolution, uh, this left logarithmic derivative is uh, inverting the evolution. Okay, and uh, since it's a derivative, it's no problem to define it, <laughs> right? But uh, it, will, it is in general a problem to define this evolution since this depends on the solution of differential equation. Okay, let me uh, do some remarks here. Uh, and I was thinking of whether I want to prove this and then decided that it will, uh, that's very technical, so I left it out. So there are books, uh, a nice exposition where you can find this. So, solutions to uh, the E type equation of E to the one theta and of the identity element are unique. So you never, I mean, you still don't know whether these things exist, but at least if they exist, there's only one, right? So, uh, and this was another problem we had with ODEs on uh, non-Banach spaces. We could have uh, infinitely many uh, so we should show E or regular use. Me too. This key. And actually prove that you can then on a regular on regular use you can integrate uh, continuously algebra analysis with equal analysis. And uh, so we already had this for the Lee algebra. Looking at these e type evolution equations here, we use left multiplication. Now you ask, hmm, we use left multiplication. What happens if I use right multiplication and write down an e type equation? You can do this and you can prove that if you can solve all differential equations of this type using left multiplication, then automatically you can also solve all uh, e type differential equations using the right multiplication. Therefore, it doesn't uh, play a role whether you define regularity using left or right multiplication. And it's sometimes advantages of working instead of left multiplication with right multiplication. Again, the diffeomorphism is an example. And to establish regularity of the diffeomorphism, would be work with the right multiplication, not with the left multiplication. And, uh, okay, so uh, one, two, three, five, one. Right. And this is the same concept. Regular. And it is pleasant, of course, because in the group there shouldn't be any preference uh, of left over right. Uh, okay, sometimes there's only a computational advantage. Okay, let's see more. Yes, this modeled on a common space. So the reason for this is on Banach space we have the usual only solution theory, and we know that uh, ordinary differential equations can smooth the other parameters between them. And um, so the regularity here is just a consequence of the usual only solution theory for Banach spaces, right? So this is the reason why when you study finite studies for the trend uh, you will have never heard of regularity because this is always automatic. So you don't need a, a name for this. All finite or even all finite groups are automatically regular. So you can always solve these different equations to get a smooth evolution of the Okay, and now we are coming finally to some examples where 
uh, we will see effective computers in action. And actually, so that was to mention Linus Ray Clarity conjecture after making this example, because then we will see that. Uh, okay, let me show you the example. The most boring example of an infinite dimension equal dimension. If you take a locally convex space, the additive group of a locally convex space, and you consider this as an abelian group. And it was an exercise. I mean, what is the Lie algebra of this one? This is just uh, the space itself. Because the ten, every tangent space of, of the space, well, it's isomorphic to the space itself, and the leap bracket is uh, if we write a zero leap. So this is the constant zero bracket you get here. Okay. Um, right. So we look at eta from zero one with values, uh, well, in the Lie algebra of E, with values in E. And now let's write all of what the, what the equation is. So we have gamma dot of t is equal to, and now we need gamma of t lower uh, um, lower dot eta. Now remember, so this is t lambda gamma of t. Of theta of t. Now, this is a very fancy notation for the following. What was the product in this group? It's addition. Addition is bilinear if we derivate the uh, bilinear mapping in uh, one component. We just get <coughs> the, um, we just get sort of the uh, bilinear mapping evaluated in the other component, right? So, uh, well, I mean, here I should say this is uh, minus. So what we get here is actually as a result just eta of t. Sorry, second. What was I saying? No, but the, sorry, but the, if I can fix this and just add it from the from the left, this is. Uh, also not linear, but uh, sort of if you're derivating into this, and this uh, this entry does not play rules, it falls out. And uh, here, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is just because we fixed this entry, and we are just derivating into. Uh, so we're just derivating this map b gets to uh, w for something seven plus b, right? And then we are derivating this in v. This is constant. It's from our sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, stupid mistake. so this is actually what we get. So we get gamma dot is equal to eta. This is an integral equation, right? So I mean, or it should be an integral equation. This is sort of the easiest uh, differential equation. The function we are searching does not even appear on the right hand side. So we see, I mean, what is the solution of this? So gamma of t is the weak integral of eta of t from zero to t. Um, actually, I'm cheating here a little bit because uh, this is using that our condition was gamma of zero is the identity element in the group and the identity element in the group is the zero in the vector space, right? So this is why you don't see a linear term in front of, uh, of this integral. So this is the weak integral. And now this explains why, if we consider this locally convex space as an abelian group, this is 
uh, regular in the sense of you know if and only if it's making uh, complete, right? Because we are asking that all of these uh, of these uh, integrals exist, so it's regular. That's regular if and only if he makes it complete. Uh, okay, and uh, you can uh, one can also show in this reference in the lecture notes um, if you have a Lie group modeled on the space E, if the Lie group is regular, then you can basically interpret uh, these uh, equations we have on the on the modeling space as an equation of Lie type on your Lie group. So um, actually, this equality here um, becomes uh, an implication. So if you have a Lie group which is modeled on the space E and the Lie group is regular, then the modeling space needs to be Mackey regular. Uh, it's uh, as a Mackey complete of Mackey regular space. Okay, so this is this is sort of the connection between um, between the uh, between Mackey uh, completeness and regularity of the Lie group. Uh, and shoot. And so, to, uh, to say it once more, this Milner regularity conjecture, where you actually are interested in uh, the question is this Lie group regular or to produce counter examples? So the challenge is if you want to produce a counter example, you need to find the Lie group modeled on a Mackey complete space, the Lie group now in the sense uh, of this Bastianic calculus stuff we are all, uh, we were talking since yesterday about, uh, such that uh, these differential equations are either not solvable or the evolution operator fails to be smooth. Right? If you can find such a thing, then you have solved. Uh, so, I mean, since I said this Milner project from 83, so this is now what, what uh, 37 years or something like that, roundabout, uh, that this conjecture is old. And at the moment, nobody has an idea whether this is true or not. So, if you can do this, you Basically, have solved one of the big conjectures in uh, in infinite dimensional Lie theory. Either you find a complex up or a meta theorem establishing the regularity. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, you don't get a million dollars for it, but uh, still. Uh, so I would be very happy if you can do that. Because I should do this as an exercise. You can put it on the exam. Yes, <laughs> exactly. If you pass it, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, no, um, let me let me give you. Um, uh, one example of how solutions to uh, this regularity problem look in a slightly more involved situation. We will not improve um, this year, but I included it because I, I guess at least Hans will appreciate it. Uh, if, I, if I show you this one, because it's very near to uh, some of the things which happen. On one hand, in Lie groups, on in infinite dimensional Lie groups appearing in numerical analysis, and also uh, in control theory applications. And this is the next example. So let A be a continuous inverse algebra. Right? Um, where, so, such that A, so this is locally convex space, is making complete. If the topology A is given by family of submultiplicative semi norms. Actually, what I'm what I'm going to write down holds more general, but uh, to state the general con uh, condition, so we would more we'll need more work. Uh, working with these um, continuous inverse algebras and 
submultiple sub seminars are basically seminars which behave like this. Whenever you product two things, it's like this. That's a submultiple seminar. And we want that the locally convex topology is induced by a family of seminars which all have this property for all x and y. You can generalize this, this is not the best you can do for the regularity, but it's sort of at least the easiest to state condition which ensures that this kind of way. Um, so then the, the unit group of the CAA, so we know already that this is an infinite dimensional E group. Um, then the unit group with the multiplication inherent from the algebra is regular. Um, and the solutions of the type equation. So I'm always writing the type equation to, uh, we have them somewhere here. Well, this, this type of equation. This is sort of my personal notation because it became tedious after some time to say, well, it's the equation where you shift the, uh, the curve into the Li algebra by left multiplication all over the group or something. So I don't know whether other people like to call this lead type. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's used uh, quite a lot. Okay, good. Yeah, then, then I, good. Then, uh, because I wasn't sure. So. And I, I think that's uh, also going back to see himself, because in, in the final dimension case, he, he uh, and if you have a solid really group, then he, he showed this, basically how you could solve these type of questions by integrating the groups. It's just sticking my point. Yeah, so this is, so it's actually, <laughs> this is actually, so here, in this case, the solution, so the gamma, if I want to solve this equation for a curve eta going into the Lie algebra of this unit group, then the gamma solution is given by the Volterra type series. So it's uh, yeah, one plus sum, and we have a series, and we have integrated into from zero to t, from uh, zero to uh, and minus one, uh, and so forth, until the equal from zero to t two, and so eta of t one times and what the copies of this eta t n e t one t. So we get this Volterra type of series of iterated integrals. Right? So you're integrating the product of these guys over uh, all of these time steps. So you're so the t1 uh, or the, the t2 to tn, so they are basically forming some sort of partition of the time interval from zero to t. Right? And uh, so you get these Volterra type integrals, which often pop up in control theory problems, for example. This is at least uh, where I saw them the last time. And uh, if you ask control, you can understand, oh, yeah, it's clear that this should be the solution. But I was uh, nevertheless uh, quite happy to figure out that this is something which is of interest to people. But I mean, my personal history is not coming again with war stories. Right? So, like in the old days when I was young and stupid, um, I thought, well, this regularity thing is just something which is of interest to infinite dimensional theory, right? We want this to drive our theory. Uh, we need this regularity condition uh, because it makes these theory work. And this is, of course, a good reason to look at these things. However, in a lot of the infinite dimensional e groups, which people care about because they can be used in application, from American analysis control theory to uh, quantum field theories, stochastic analysis, and so forth, these Lie type equations really turn up as something people are intrinsically interested in to solve some problems they have, whatever the I mean, it depends now on what, what you're talking and which, what the lead group is. But in these lead type equations, they want to solve, and then usually they get some sort of Volterra series power series uh, uh, thing going. That's also on the lead group, but it's feasible. But people really care about solutions to these ordinary differential equations. And uh, at least I found this extremely surprising when I found out for the first time, perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised because the theory is also informed by, uh, I mean, it's not like people, like, so was the way woke up one one oh, let's, let's study these differential groups. I mean, that came from uh, some idea of why you wanted to do that. And uh, so, in a way, my original idea that these 
regularity conditions and these differential equations are somewhat intrinsic to E theory was not entirely correct. At least they pop up in lots of places. So it's not just an idle game if we have to make our infinite dimensional theory work. Okay, so we've already seen Müller's regularity conjecture. I think I will just state the next result. I think that it's time for a little break. Uh, and we will prove this after the break. So let me. Uh, A little demo. In the lecture, we will usually not uh, delve very deeply into this uh, rabbit hole of regularity because there are lots of things going on when you study these differential equations. There are lots of identities and also tricks what you can do with this regularity. And also, the strong advanced techniques from these theory are usually hiding them because the proofs get technical and involved. So, you really need to Look at uh, look deeply into the matter and see why regularity is driving these results. For example, the proof of Lee two with regular Lee groups is okay when you have a certain background. For example, when you know the Maurer Cartan uh, differential form and, and these things from finite dimensional ones. So if you like differential forms, it's a similar thing here. But uh, I don't want to go that direction. I don't want to dive so deeply into the theory. What our main um, uh, thing will be is we will um, want to use this regularity condition to define the Lie group exponential map. So for all these infinite dimension Lie groups, once they are regular, there is a map called the Lie group exponential, which we will define. And it will depend on our ability to solve Lie type differential equations. Actually, we need a lot less than the general Lie type differential equation, but uh, let's have a look at this. Um, so let me just take the following demo. Then we'll take a short break to recover. So let G be a regular. And this will, for most of the rest of the chapter, be the standing assumption that we're working with regularly. So we don't need to care about what we can solve differential equations. Um, regularly, you can. Let's fix a left invariant vector field on the D group. Um, then there exists a unique gamma x from 0 to 1 with values in the group, uh, sorry, uh, 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 from the real with values in the group with the property that if I take the derivative of this curve at some time point t, I guess it's x evaluates in gamma of x. Right? So um, basically, basically uh, when you know this language, this equation just means that the gamma of x is a flow of the left invariant vector field. Uh, okay, for uniqueness, I should have said that I also have written here, obviously, for uniquity, uh, fix the initial condition, so starting at the end. Okay, um, so in particular, every left invariant so remember a vector field is called complete if uh, basically for any initial condition I get an integral curve, so a curve which satisfies this, which I can continue for all time. Right? And for left invariant vector fields, the point is if I can solve it for a curve starting at the identity because the field is left invariant. I can just multiply um, this uh, the solution I have starting at the identity with an arbitrary point where I want my solution to start. And because of left invariance, I can just conveniently move that out and see that this condition also holds for 
uh, point multiplied with the gamma of x, right? So basically, uh, I give you, let's say we'll take a break until quarter past, then give you a little bit of time to meditate on that. Uh, so the point is, if I get an integral curve starting at the identity, the same integral curves multiplied from the left with, say, an element of g, gives me an integral curve of the left invariant vector field, which starts at g. Right. Okay, and now we'll take, we'll take a break for 20 minutes until quarter past, and then we'll resume. We'll stop the recording. Thanks.